today we're going to look at Young's experiment. And see what that can tell us about the concept of spatial coherence. Young's experiment was performed in the early 19th century. It was the first definitive demonstration of the wave nature of light and also called the uh, double slit experiment. We're going to look at a variation called the two pinhole experiment. So imagine that we have an opaque screen in which there are two pinholes. As illustrated here. Now this is a cross section. If you imagine looking from the right back at this, you'd see an infinite plane with two holes in it. Pinholes P1 at top and P2 at the bottom. And then to the right of that, there is an output plane where we're going to observe the intensity. And that intensity is due to a source that's over to the left of the pinhole plane. And that point source produces a field amplitude G1 of T. Now, suppose we're interested in the intensity at a particular point Q at the output. There will be two paths by which light can travel from the source to the output. One through pinhole 1 and one through pinhole 2. Our question then is, what is the field? at Q and what's the time average intensity? Well, let's first look at the field at the pinholes. Pinhole one, we'll call the field G of P1 and time. So function of position and time. It's gonna have traveled a distance, let's call it R1 prime. There'll be a change in the amplitude in propagation. Let's call that amplitude A1 prime. And there'll be a time delay so that this field will be the source oscillation G1 with a time delay of R1 prime over the speed of light C. Likewise, for the field at pinhole P2, we'll have G at P2 and T. Uh, if we call this distance R2 prime, uh, we'll call the resulting amplitude A2 prime and then that will have a delay t minus r2 prime over c. So those will be our pinhole fields. And then the output field at q will be a combination of fields that are propagated from those two pinholes. Suppose this, suppose this distance is r1 and this is r2. Uh, there'll be additional amplitude changes. So Let's write the field at point Q as a function of time as a final amplitude A1 for this red path. And the total time delay there will be the sum of these distances R1 prime plus R1 over the speed of light. And then for the blue path, an amplitude A2, G1 of T minus R2 plus R2 prime over the speed of light. Now let's clean up this argument a little bit by translating the time axis. So we replace T by T plus R1 prime plus R1 over C. And that's going to convert this argument to just T, because you'll have this minus itself. And so the output field, G of Q as a function of time, will be, well, let's assume that these paths are close enough in distance, and the pinholes are of equal size, and so that these two amplitudes are at least approximately equal. So we'll just factor out a constant A, 
And then this first term with this shift of the time axis gives us G1 of T. And then we're going to have another G1 term here. Now this is going to, when we shift the time axis, this is going to have R1 prime, prime plus R1 over C minus R2 plus R2 prime over C. So let's define that difference to be tau. R1 prime plus R1 over C minus R2 prime plus R2 over C. And then this argument will become T plus tau. And finally, um, the time average intensity at point Q will be, uh, we, we assume that the amplitude A is constant. So magnitude A squared, that's just due to geometrical factors. And then we have the time average of the intensity with the magnitude squared of G of T plus G, or sorry, that should have been G1 of T, plus G1 of T plus tau. magnitude squared, and time average. Now this looks almost identical to what we get at the output uh, of the detector of the Michelson interferometer. And indeed, it is. If we have a point source, and this double pinhole experiment basically just gives us the same information, the same interferogram that we get with the Michelson interferometer, but it does it all in parallel at one time. Now, the Michelson interferometer, for practical reasons, uh, tends to give you a much stronger output signal, and so it is, gives you a more desirable response if you're trying to, with very great detail, measure the, say, measure the um, uh, spectral response of a source or something like that. But in principle, this two pinhole experiment gives you the same information. So, I of Q is equal to the magnitude of A squared times the time average of the magnitude of G1 of T plus G1 of T plus tau, magnitude squared, time average. And, and that is exactly the kind of output we had in the Michelson interferometer, so we can immediately write that this will just be Two, we'll have this additional magnitude A squared from the propagation. I zero, one plus the real part of little gamma of tau. Where I zero is the time average G1 of T squared. And little gamma of tau is the time average of g of t plus tau that's g1 sorry times g1 of t and normalize by dividing by i0 now as a specific example suppose this is our z-axis here and suppose that we have our pinholes um, at a height plus or minus h over 2 along the x-axis. So this would be both of these distances are h over 2. And our source is right on the z-axis, and that's a distance d prime from the pinhole plane, and then from that to the output plane is a distance d. And for a particular output point at a height x, these two paths, And we can work out what they are. Now, the, the R1 prime and the R2 prime are equal, so they kind of drop out of the calculation. 
Oh, so that's here and there. Uh, but we do have to figure out what the R1 and R2 values are. So R1, we'll just use the quad, uh, I'm sorry, Pythagorean theorem for this and then put that in the form of the paraxial approximation. So that would be D plus um, this value minus this value. So x minus h over 2 squared plus y squared, where y would come out from out of the board. And then that's divided by 2d. Again, that's from we use several times the proxial approximation for uh, the square root of x minus h over 2 squared plus y squared plus d squared. And then for r2, the value would be d plus, and down here, it would be x minus minus h over 2 or x plus h over 2. over 2d and then tau which is in this case going to be just r1 minus r2 over c because the r1 prime and r2 prime cancel out uh, so the d's will cancel the y squared term will cancel when you expand these out you're going to get x squared and h over 2 squared those will cancel when you subtract the only thing that will be left will be here you'll have minus 2x times h over 2, so that's minus xh. And then here you'll have plus that, but then you do minus it here. So you're going to have minus two of those. You're going to have a minus xh from the first and a minus xh from the second, and that's going to be um, over 2d times c. So that is minus h over 2d, I'm sorry, over cd because you have two of these up here and it cancels the two there, times x. So, in this case, the intensity is a function of position x and y in this output plane. This is the z-axis there, would be 2 magnitude a squared, i0, 1, plus the real part of your gamma, which is determined by the temporal coherence properties of the source, evaluated at minus h over cd times x, be independent of the y coordinate, only depend on the x coordinate. So you would get um, now the full interferogram that you would get in a Michelson interferometer, now instead of as a function of the displacement of one of the mirrors, now it's just a function of position on this plane. So you could just, in one, one go, just take a picture of that whole interferogram. Again, it's not as useful practically as the Michelson interferometer is, but in principle, we see that we can spatially lay out the temporal coherence properties of a single point source by using this kind of system. Now, we ask, what happens if you have more than one source back here? Well, then things get a little interesting. A little less trivially uh, related to temporal coherence. Now let's look at what happens with the two pinhole experiment if we have multiple point sources let's just have start off with two point sources so here's our pinhole p1 and p2 and our output screen where we're looking at the intensity and we'll take an arbitrary point q there now suppose we have a source g1 of t over here and somewhere up here, we've got a source G2 of T. Well, from G1 to P1, there'll be a path. And then from P1 to Q, there'll be another path. 
from G1 to P2, a path, and from P2 to Q, another path. From G2 to P1, a path, and then P1 to Q, and G2, P2 a path, and then P2 to Q. So, let's now look at the fields at the pinholes. At pinhole P1, what would, what would the field be? G a P1 as a function of time. Well, it has two contributions now from point source G1 and point source G2. Let's call this distance from G1 to P1 R11 prime. And from G2 to P1, R12 prime. And suppose the amplitude variation from G1 to P1 is um, A11 prime. And we're going to get G1 of T minus the time delay to propagate a distance R11 prime. It's R11 prime over C. And then the contribution from source G2 Let's suppose that has an amplitude A12 prime, and the oscillation then is G2 of t minus the time delay due to this distance, R12 prime over C. So there's the field at pinhole P1. How about the field at pinhole P2? Well, then I'll have a contribution from G1. And let's call this distance here R21 prime. And suppose the amplitude is A21 prime. The source is oscillating with amplitude G1 of T. And the time delay will be R21 prime over C. And then we also have a contribution from source G2. And let's suppose this distance from G2 to P2 is R22 prime. And suppose the corresponding amplitude factor is A22 prime. Then you'll have G2 of T minus R22 prime over C. So there now are the two fields at the two pinholes. And this is a very important point. In general, G2 of P and T is never equal to, um, that should just, I'm sorry, just G of P2 and T is never equal to G of P1 and T plus tau for any tau. In other words, these two fields cannot be uh, brought into alignment, made the same, simply by shifting the time axis. For one or the other because you can do that for one of the sources or the other source but not for both at the same time because of these different distances and this now takes us beyond uh, the simple analogy to the michelson interferometer and brings us into the realm of what we call spatial coherence we could imagine adding more and more point sources back here even an infinite number continuous distribution of point sources that would then this kind of calculation here would end up being a bunch of integrals and stuff uh, but what we would really ultimately be interested in then would be the relation between the fields at points pinholes p1 and p2 so let's imagine then that we just focus on the fields at those two points p1 and p2 without reference to whatever's to the left of that screen so we simply look at this these two point uh, what effectively are secondary point sources and see how they contribute the field at an arbitrary output point Q. So this again is still R1 and this is R2 just as before. 
and we can say that the field at point Q is a function of time. Now, uh, and let's assume that the amplitude variations for these two propagations are about the same, so we'll factor it out as A, and we have the field at pinhole P1, T minus the time delay R1 over C, plus the field at pinhole P2 with a time delay R2 over C. And that is our field at the output. And these two fields, even if shifted arbitrarily, will never exactly line up in general. So they are spatially distinguished. Right? They are not simply temporal variations of each other, but they are actually represent a variation of the coherence properties in space. So we do a shift here. T, uh, replace it by T plus R2 over C, and define tau to be R2 minus R1 over C. And then our output field at point Q, as a function of time, becomes A. G at P1. Let's see. So we replace T by T plus R2 over C. That becomes T plus R2 over C minus R1 over C. And R2 minus R1 over C is tau. So this is G at P1 at T plus tau plus G at P2. And this substitution into that just gives you T. All right, so let's see what kind of fringes we can get from this field. Take the magnitude squared, the time average of that, and let's see how that would vary then as tau changes because we change this position of our point Q. So change the relative distances R1 and R2. So the intensity at the output point Q is going to be equal to, well, actually, let's just drop the, the amplitude A there, the magnitude A squared, and just say it's proportional to, so we don't care about the overall scaling, really, uh, the time average of the magnitude of G at pinhole P1 at time p plus tau plus the magnitude of the field g at pinhole p2 at time t magnitude squared time average of that so expand that out well we're going to get a time average of the magnitude squared of the field at pinhole p1 and a time average of the magnitude squared of the field at pinhole, oops, P2. And then the cross terms, we're gonna get plus, so we'll take this times the conjugate of that, that's G at P1, T plus tau, times G conjugate, P2, T, and then plus the conjugate of that, plus the time average of G conjugate at P1, T plus tau, times G at P2, and T. So that is our intensity distribution with, without worrying about the overall uh, amplitude of it. Let's define IP1 to be the time average of G at P1 as a function of time, magnitude squared. So it doesn't matter that we have this time offset here because we're integrating or averaging overall time anyway. And likewise, I at P2, 
to be the time average of the field at pinhole P2 magnitude squared. In general, I at P1 will not be the same as I at P2. These are not I0. They could be different intensities. And then this term here, and then this is its conjugate, let's define that to be similar to what we did in the Michelson interferometer, but now with more parameters. This is gamma of P1 and P2 and tau, not just gamma of tau, because it depends on these two points, P1 and P2. And we define that to be the time average of the field at pinhole P1, or point P1 in the field, at time T plus tau, times the conjugate of the field at point P2, and time T. We call that, right, we, for the Michelson interferometer with a single source, we call that the self-coherence function. Now we're going to call this the mutual coherence function. It's a function of both time and the position of the two points in the field. In principle, for every two points in the field, you could get a different mutual coherence function. So it's no longer just a function of time, but also of space. And then I at Q is going to be proportional to I P1 plus I P2. And then the interference terms are going to be these, these two, the sum of, of this guy, which will be defined to be gamma P1 P2 tau, and it's conjugate. So then it ends up being then that sum is just 2 times the real part of gamma of P1, P2, and tau. And it's the variations in that that result in interference fringes. If that gamma is equal to zero, then you just simply get the sum of the intensities from the fields at the two points, the two pinholes. If this is non-zero, then as tau changes, for example, as you, you move the point Q so that you change this, uh, the relative time delays, then you'll see interference fringes. So this is the source of interference fringes. And coherence really is all about the ability to form interference fringes. In the case of temporal coherence, the Michelson interferometer, it's about the ability of a field uh, two versions of the field with a relative time delay to form coherence uh, interference fringes due to their temporal coherence. And in the case here, that's really has two components, the spatial difference and the temporal difference. So if for two different points in the field, for some time offset tau, you're able to see fringes, then there's some, we say there is some spatial coherence between the field at those two points. If there are no fringes possible for any value of tau, we say the field at those two points are spatially incoherent. Now notice that uh, if we have the two points P1 and P2, which no longer has to refer to pinholes, they're just points in the field, if we have, now, P1 and P2 are the same, well, this now just becomes gamma of tau, the self-coherence function for the field at point P1. In other words, if we took the field at point P1 and put it into a Michelson interferometer, 
Well, gamma of tau is what we would measure from the interferogram. So it reduces down. This is a more general concept. The mutual coherence function reduces to the self-coherence function when the two points coincide. Just as we did for self-coherence, it's convenient to define a normalized version of this mutual coherence function, little gamma of P1 and P2 and tau, which is equal to big gamma of P1 and P2 and tau, normalized by dividing it by the square root of the intensities, product of the intensities at the two points, I of P1, I of P2. Obviously, at, uh, as P1 and P2 uh, become the same point, this would just be the square root of I of P1 squared, It'd just be I of P1, and that's just what we had with the complex degree of coherence that we had for uh, the mutual coher the self coherence function rather of a single source, and then this generalizes that to diff two different points. So we call this again the complex degree of coherence, but we could say mutual coherence to make it clear that it's coherence between two different points in space. If they're the same point, we could call that the complex degree of self-coherence if we wanted to. So with this notation, then the field in the output plane in an arbitrary point Q would be proportional to I, P1, intensity at point 1, plus I, P2, intensity at point 2, plus 2 times the square root of the product of these intensities times the real part of the complex degree of mutual coherence, gamma, P1, P2, and tau. Again, this is what's going to give you interference fringes. So as the point Q changes as we move in space in the output plane, if we see fringes, it'll be due to this, this term here. If that term's not there, we just have a constant sum of the two intensities. This uh, little gamma is normalized so that its magnitude is always between zero and one. If, uh, if it's equal to zero, we say the field at the two points are incoherent. If it's equal to one, the fields at the two different points are coherent. And in between, they're partially coherent. Now, as it stands, this is a little bit complicated because right, this involves both spatial effects and temporal effects. It would be very nice oops, to, effectively, uh, to effectively separate space and time in this would be simpler. So towards that end, uh, we might find it useful to think of the limit of quasi-monochromatic light as we have before. So light that's almost chromatic, monochromatic rather. Um, so G at a particular point P is a function of time then. In this case, we could write it as an amplitude A as a function of position and time 
times a center frequency, e to the minus i, 2 pi nu zero t. Of course, if it was perfectly monochromatic, then this would just be a of p. It would not be a function of time. All time dependence would be this pure sinusoidal variation of frequency nu zero. But if it's quasi-monochromatic, then this amplitude here, this envelope of the oscillation, can be slowly varying. But we will assume that A of P and T plus tau is essentially equal to A at P and time T for all tau of interest. What would be the tau values of interest? Well, any time delays you might have within your optical system. If for all of those possible time delays, these uh, envelopes at different points in space effectively don't change, uh, then we can say that the, the field is quasi-monochromatic. So let's see how that allows us to separate the spatial effects from the temporal effects. So let's look at our mutual coherence function, P, gamma P1, P2, and tau, under the quasi-monochromatic approximation. So the field at point P1 will be amplitude A P1 at time T plus tau, e to the minus i 2 pi center frequency nu zero, time t plus tau times the conjugate of the field at point p2 at time t e to the plus i because of the conjugation 2 pi nu zero t so we get let's put the a's together a p1 t plus tau a conjugate p2 t and the exponential factors well here the e to the plus i 2 pi nu 0 t cancels the e to the minus i 2 pi nu 0 t and that just leaves e to the minus i 2 pi nu 0 tau and finally, our quasi-monochromatic approximation is that this A P1 T plus tau is essentially the same as A P1 T. So this becomes A P1 T times A conjugate point P2 and time E to the minus I 2 pi nu zero tau. And now we're going to define that time average there to be a function j of p1 and p2. It's only a function of the two points in space because we're time averaging away all dependence on time. And then we have e to the minus i 2 pi nu zero tau. So we've separated out spatial effects from temporal effects. This function j we call the mutual intensity, J, P1, P2, is how do you get the mutual intensity? You take the field at one point, P1, it's a function of time, multiplied by the conjugate of the field at a point, P2, is a function of time, and take the time average, and that is the mutual intensity. Why do we call it mutual intensity? Well, a field times the conjugate of a field will have the same units as the magnitude of the field squared, which we think of as an intensity. And in fact, when the two points coincide, so if P1 and P2 are just both equal to P, this then reduces to the, just the magnitude of A at P as a function of T 
squared time average, which is simply what we think of as the intensity of the field at a point. So mutual intensity is the same kind of operation, but with the fields coming from two different points. Mutual intensity is how we characterize the spatial coherence as distinct from temporal coherence of a field. And just as we did <clears throat> with the, um, all the other coherence functions, it's very useful to normalize this and take and make little mu of P1, P2, which is J of P1, P2, and normalize by the 1 over the square root of the intensities of the fields at the two different points. We call that the complex coherence factor. Because we've normalized out the overall intensity, uh, this is very useful because if the magnitude of mu is equal to 1, then we can say that the fields at those two different points are perfectly coherent, meaning they will produce fringes uh, with ha which have the maximum possible amplitude. If magnitude of mu is equal to 0, the fields are perfectly incoherent. In between, they're partially coherent. So. This really now allows us to define the concept of spatial coherence as distinct from temporal coherence. In the monochromatic limit, the field at a point P as a function of time would be an amplitude that was not dependent on time, but just a phasor, uh, you know, complex number that represents the amplitude and phase, non-changing amplitude and phase of the field there, and then the actual frequency, e to the minus i, 2 pi nu t. Well, in that case, your mutual intensity function J at P1, P2 is going to be A at P1 times E to the minus I 2 pi nu T times A conjugate of P2 times E to the plus I 2 pi nu T, which the two time factors end up, their product is just equal to 1, so we just get this time average, but there's no, no time dependence in there. So that's just the amplitude of the field at point 1 times the conjugate of, of the amplitude of the field at point 2. And that is what the mutual intensity is for a monochromatic field. And then when we normalize this to the complex coherence factor, up1, p2, it would just be a p1 times a conjugate of p2 over the square root of their intensities, but that's just going to be then the product of their amplitudes. Magnitude a of p1, magnitude a of p2. And of course, a of p1 over its magnitude is a unit complex number. It's just a pure phase, and likewise for a conjugate of p2 over its magnitude. And so we will have that the magnitude of mu P1, P2 is equal to 1 for all pairs of points P1 and P2 in a monochromatic field. If mu P1 and P2 is equal to 0, for all P1 and P2 that are not the same. So this is up here, this is the monochromatic case, which we take to be perfectly 
coherent, fully coherent. And in this case, although we'll see, we can't exactly have this be true. There's a little subtlety here, but for now, we'll just say if all points that are not the same have this complex degree of coherence is equal to zero, then that would be in case of an incoherent field. And of course, anything in between would be partially coherent. So now we have a way to measure spatial coherence. And we can talk about spatially incoherent fields, spatially coherent fields, or partially, uh, spatially partially coherent fields. Now what we need to do in future lectures is to figure out how an optical system modifies either the mutual intensity or the complex degree of coherence, etc. What are the effects of a, an optical system on the spatial coherence properties of a field.